And we're going to talk about the management of AS during pregnancy, and we're going to review the, the recommendations for, for management of BAV aorthopathy in patients that are already pregnant. Now, this is actually a patient of Dr. Connolly's, and we, we, we managed her as a group recently. She had a history of unicuspid versus bicuspid valve. She had a healthy childhood, routine follow-up without any problems, and she was completely symptomatic prior to pregnancy. Then she presented to us at 32 weeks gestation, and the reason for the referral was management of her, her AS during pregnancy. And here you can see her physical exam, so the carotids are a bit delayed and a bit damped. Normal venous pressure, and she had this very loud, somewhat late peaking systolic murmur, but A2 was still preserved. Now moving to the echo, on the left-hand side you can see the LV, so normal size and function, not much in the way of LVH. And when we zoom into the aortic valve on the right-hand side, you can see that the cusps are clearly abnormal, so reduced excursion and also thickened. Putting color Doppler on, you can see that there's clear aliasing in keeping with, with outflow tract obstruction. And then when we move to the short axis, you can see the valve morphology a little bit better. So the first question was whether this was unicuspid or bicuspid. I think we agree that this was a unicuspid. That's the most common version where you can see the only commissure between the none and the left. So we felt that the unicommissural valve instead of a typical bicuspid aortic valve. And then when we put color Doppler, similar to what we saw on the long axis, that wasn't much in the way of AR. Now moving to the Doppler data, you can see that the diastology was completely normal, so normal PA pressures, normal E prime velocity, so everything looked very good from a relaxation standpoint. But here's the aortic valve data. So on the left-hand side, you can see the gradient. The gradient was quite high, so 47. And we can talk a little bit more about the profile later, but I think without a doubt, this is a gradient that would scare an echocardiographer and the provider. Now on the right-hand side, you have the LVOT TVI, and then we got an LVOT diameter of 2.3 with an LVOT TVI of 19, which gave us an aortic valve area of 0 0.9. So 47 for gradient, 0 0.9 for valve area. So with those numbers, how would you grade her AS? Moderate, moderate severe, severe, or very severe? So please go ahead and vote. Severe, and in fact, a lot of the group members agreed with severe. There was some outliers, myself included, to be quite honest, I felt was moderate or severe, and we'll come back to that in a second. And I think a lot of this had to do with how we calculated TVI. We just talked about the high output state, but if you look, and we went back and we tried to remeasure the TVIs, and then sometimes they're very challenging, but you can see they're all well within the normal range, but that's in the setting of pregnancy where you would expect high flow. So you just have to be a bit skeptical about the numbers that we're getting with echo. And that's even more important when we look at flow across the other valves, and you can see that increased flow was seen across all the others, which would make you suspect that the flow will be high across the LVOT as well. And that takes us to the issue of aortic valve area calculation, and I think the LVOT TVI is a big Achilles heel, and is a common reason for discrepant gradient and aortic valve uh, area values. And you just have to be extra careful when flow is expected to be abnormal. And that goes for high output, so AV fistula, severe anemia, but also pregnancy. But you also have to be extra careful when the flow is expected to be low, when you have systolic dysfunction, or an, a small hyperdynamic hypertrophy ventricle in someone that can have low stroke volume and bad AS. So just be careful with the LVOT flow calculation as you put out your numbers. And I think the other thing to remember is that sometimes you can't get a good LVO TVI. It is what it is. And don't forget that we have other ways of getting stroke volume. So you can use your volumetric. You can use 3D now. So if you can't get it by, by Doppler, just use other modalities to ensure that all numbers line up. Now let's go back to her case. So she's asymptomatic. She has moderate to severe or severe AS, depending on how you slice the numbers. So what should we recommend? Continue with pregnancy, aortic valve replacement at the time of delivery, and termination of pregnancy. Sorry. 
Very good. And this is our impression too. We just we decided to continue with pregnancy. She was completely symptomatic. And here you can see her follow-up echo, so shortly before delivery, so the gradient was unchanged, and then the uric valvera was, was similar to prior. So we felt that this was asymptomatic, severe AF, she was, as she was co-managed with MFM, and she did very well. She had an uncomplicated vaginal delivery. She was, she was admitted to the ICU for postpartum monitoring just for, for one day, and she was dismissed on post-op day three, and both the mom and the baby did remarkably well. And here you can see your follow-up echo, so after pregnancy, so the LVF was normal, the gradient came down as flow came down, but the auric valve area was about the same. And the mid-ascending aorta was 38. And you can argue that these numbers were not too dissimilar from the pre-pregnancy numbers where the gradient was 36 and the mid-ascending was 37. So again, I think it really speaks for this relationship between flow and pressure. Now let's talk a little bit about pregnancy and heart disease, and Dr. Conley touched upon some of the things we're gonna talk about shortly. I think the first thing is to remember the physiologic changes that occur during pregnancy. So first, there's increased cardiac output, and that plateaus in the third trimester. Also, there's a decrease in SVR and PVR, and there's an increase in heart rate. So if you think about it, I mean, this really mimics what we see during exercise and during stress tests. So again, just think about pregnancy as a stress to the body. And when we talked about uh, or talk about any intervention in a non-cardiac uh, um, setting, risk assessment before the intervention is critical, and I think that goes for pregnancy as well. So if one is contemplating pregnancy, you want to talk about assessment before they get pregnant rather than doing this afterwards. And there are several different resources. I think this is one that I think I find very helpful. This was published in 2017 that walks you through these changes during pregnancy and how to go about each lesion. So there's a lot out in the literature that can, that can help you out. Now, there's some very clear predictors of poor outcome during pregnancy, and they've been replicated in several different studies. So pH, reduced functional capacity, obstructive lesions, but remember, regurgitant lesions are well tolerated, use of anticoagulant uh, agents, as Dr. Conley pointed out, mechanical valve, whether it's aortic or mitral, and cyanotic heart disease. So keep in mind, if you see a patient like this before pregnancy, things might not go very well. Now, this is the WHO risk four, so I advise against pregnancy. And here's what they have for severe obstructive lesions. So severe MS, severe coart, but remember, this is severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. So in our patient, even if we called, the patient was completely symptomatic, and therefore we decided to proceed with pregnancy. Now, what about the dilated aorta? And if you remember, her aorta was 38, and this is what the WHO says about dilated aortas. So class three, so significant increase in maternal morbidity and mortality happens if you have an aorta that measures between 40 and 45 in Marfan syndrome, but in BAV you can move that cutoff a little bit higher, so 45 to 50. And category four, so advice against pregnancy if you have an aorta greater than 45 in Marfan or greater than 50 in BAV. So this is what the WHO would say. And this is what we do in our clinic here. We have a little bit more of an individualized approach. So in terms of risk assessment, of course, we take into account the aortic size, but other risk factors as we do for any given patient with a big aorta. So you talk about the family history, you talk about dissection risk, concomitant genetic abnormality. So again, you just look at the overall picture. Our approach is if it's less than 45, there's no contraindication. If it's greater than 50, you avoid, but in that 40 to 50 range, you really have to individualize to the patient. And then, as Dr. Conley showed, I mean, I'm stealing this slide from her. I mean, I think this cannot be overemphasized. When it comes to pregnancy, it's really a multidisciplinary approach with anesthesia, MFM, cardiology, EP. So you really got to approach this as a team. So in summary, in terms of pregnancy and AS, when you're evaluating AS in the, in the echo lab, don't forget to account for the high flow that comes with pregnancy. Asymptomatic patients do well, even if severe AS is present, but don't forget that close follow-up is needed. In terms of the dilated aorta, if it's more than 50, avoid. If it's less than 45, you should be okay. And in the middle, you've got to individualize to the patient in front of you. But again, when it comes to pregnancy, pre-pregnancy counseling is always the key.